Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Thousand Layer Chocolate Brioche. That's right, I'm going to show you how to make what is basically a sexier, slightly more twisted cousin of a chocolate croissant. And while these do take a little bit of work, it is easy work and fun work, and I think very worthwhile since the people we share these with could and probably will talk about these for the rest of their lives. Or at least that's our hope. And to get started, the first thing we'll do is make this very simple brioche dough, which starts with some warm milk, which I just heated up in the microwave to about 105 degrees. And then over that, we will sprinkle one package of active dry yeast, and we will let it sit there starting to do its thing for about 10 minutes, while we go ahead and pull together the rest of the ingredients, which after the 10 minutes, we will start to add, starting with some white sugar, plus three whole large eggs, that I did beat up with a fork first before adding them, Although if you don't, that's not a deal breaker. And then we will also add our all-purpose flour, on top of which we will toss some salt. And then what we'll do is start kneading this with our dough hook for about a minute or two, or until the dough just starts to come together and almost all the flour has disappeared. And once it gets to that point, which hopefully looks a little something like this, we will stop and scrape down our hook, and we will add the last and maybe most important ingredient. And that would be some soft room temperature butter, and yes, some recipes do call for melted butter, but I do prefer it in this form, since that's the classic method. And then what we'll do once we have that transferred in is go ahead and resume kneading until that butter's been incorporated and a very soft, very smooth dough has formed. And yes, we are going to watch this until that piece of butter gets incorporated. There we go. Which reminds me, if you have to stop this a few times during the process so everything mixes in evenly, definitely go ahead and do that. And then once that butter is mixed in, like I said, we'll let this knead for a few minutes until we formed a very smooth, very soft, fairly elastic dough, which you're going to get a much better look at in a second when I eventually get this off the stand mixer and transfer it onto the work surface. And normally a dough this soft would be very, very sticky, but because this has so much butter in it, it's not going to stick, which makes this a very enjoyable dough to feel and work with. And then what we'll do after we have this shaped into a nice smooth ball is transfer that back into our bowl, which we've lightly greased with butter, and we will cover that, and we'll let that rise in a warm spot for a couple hours, or until it doubles in size. And please note, rich doughs like this that have lots of eggs and butter do take a lot longer to rise, so after a couple hours if yours hasn't doubled, just let it go. But eventually, hopefully, after a few hours or more, it will look like this. And once it does, we'll go ahead and transfer that onto our work surface, and we will press out all the air, and then what I'm going to do is divide this in half, and I'll form both halves back into a ball, and then pop them in plastic bags, and then refrigerate the dough overnight, which I think makes it easier to work with and taste better. But having said that, if you want to work with this right away, go ahead. But not me. Like I said, I'm going to pop these in the fridge overnight. And then the next day I pulled out one of the halves, which I will press out into a rectangle, using just enough flour so it doesn't stick. And once we do have that pressed out into a rectangle, We'll switch to a rolling pin, and we will attempt to somehow, some way, roll this into a rectangle about 14 inches long by about 10 inches wide. And no, it is not that easy to roll something into a rectangle. So at a certain point, we're going to stop, and we will stretch the corners in an attempt to get something closer to right angles. But be a little bit careful, since this dough is still very cold, and the butter has not warmed up yet, and it tends to tear a little bit, which will explain this not being perfectly smooth. But don't worry, that's no big deal at this point. And like I said, all we're trying to do here is get this into some kind of rectangular shape about 14 by 10 inches. Although anything close is going to work. And then once that's been accomplished, we will stop. And we will take four tablespoons of soft spreadable butter. And we will spread that over about two thirds of our dough. But we don't want to go all the way to the edge. Okay, leave about a half inch unbuttered so that we can seal our dough. Oh, and the reason I'm only using half the dough is because I only want to make four brioche, and the entire recipe will make enough for eight, but I'm actually going to save my other ball of dough for a loaf experiment, which may or may not involve some ham and cheese. And then once our dough has been buttered, we will fold over the unbuttered third, and then we'll fold the opposite side over that, keeping those edges as square and even as we can. And then once we have that sort of pressed together and sealed, we will carefully fold that in thirds again, eventually ending up with something relatively square, and since by now our dough is warmed up a little bit, and that butter is relatively soft, 
We want to be careful not to press or overhandle this. So once we have it folded up like this, what we'll do is transfer that onto a sheet pan and we will pop it in the freezer for about 15 to 20 minutes or until it's chilled and firm again. At which point we'll pull it out and proceed with the second series of folds. And we will basically repeat the exact same process for the first folds, meaning we're gonna roll this out into a rectangle. Although maybe not quite 14 by 10 this time. All right, it's okay if it's a little smaller, but the point is we want this roll thin enough so that we're able to fold it in thirds and then in thirds again, which is why it's so important that we're working with chilled dough. Okay, that butter that's being sandwiched between the layers of dough needs to hold its shape and stay in sort of a solid layer and not just be mushed and mashed into the dough like we did when we needed it. So please make sure your dough is well chilled before doing any of these folding steps. So like I said, we'll go ahead and roll that out into a rectangle, at which point we'll stop and fold this in the thirds, except this time before we complete the fold, I like to dab on a little bit of water with my fingertips, just to ever so slightly moisten those edges, just to help make sure this dough sticks together. Okay, since we have to use a little bit of flour to roll this out thin, Sometimes that'll prevent these layers of dough from adhering together. So I find a little bit of moisture very helpful. And once we have that folded up into thirds, we will roll that out a little bit and then fold it in thirds again, just like we did the first time. At which point, yes, you guessed it. We're gonna pop this back in the freezer for another 15 minutes or so until it's nice and chilled before we pull it out to do the final fold. And that of course starts with the same step I've rolled this out into a rectangle or something relatively close. Oh, and in case you want to use the proper lingo, what we're doing here by creating all these different layers of butter and dough in the business is called lamination. And I should mention, you can actually make this recipe with no lamination. All right, we could just add more butter to the dough and then not do any of these folding steps. Or on the other hand, if you have the time and patience, you could do a couple more folds to achieve even more layers. All right, so that is up to you. I mean, you are after all the creator and chief laminator, but for me personally, I think this is the perfect number of folds. And for this last one, once we get this to the rectangle stage, we will fold it in thirds as usual, but we'll stop right there. Okay, we won't fold this into thirds again to make the square. We are gonna leave it in this rectangular shape because that's basically the shape we want to cut our four portions. So once we've completed this fold, we will wrap it and pop it in the freezer for another 10 or 15 minutes. At which point we'll pull it out, and again using just enough flour so it doesn't stick, we will roll that out into a rectangle about 12 by 6 inches, and that is the size and shape we want this before we cut our portions, which we always want to do with very, very cold dough. So yes, you guessed it. I'm going to pop this back into the freezer for another 10 or 15 minutes, at which point we can pull it out, and then finally, finally portion this into four pieces. Although before we do, I like to trim off a little bit of the edges, especially on the long sides, which will expose all those layers of lamination. And by doing that, we'll get something that puffs up a little more and I think looks a little better. So for me, it's well worth sacrificing that little bit of dough, but I guess that is technically optional. But either way, once we have that trimmed, we will divide this into four equal rectangles, which hopefully end up being about six by three inches or something close to that. And once our four portions are cut, I'm gonna pop three back in the fridge to keep them cool while I show you how to shape one of these things using the old braid and roll technique. So what we'll do first is flatten this out a little bit with our rolling pin, but do not roll over and crush those edges. And then we'll take a pizza wheel or a knife and we will make two cuts, starting about a half inch down from the more rounded end. And we will cut all the way down through the flat end to form three hopefully even strips of dough and once that's set, we will simply braid this together. But pro tip, as you cross these over, do not flip the strip of dough over. All right, we want the side facing up to stay the side facing up. And we will go down as shown, carefully laying those strips of dough over each other until we get down to the bottom and run out of dough. And once that happens, we will simply press the ends together and then flip it over. And then if we're gonna stuff these with chocolate, which I definitely am and hope you do, we will take some rather large chunks of very dark chocolate and we will place those along the braid. And I am being fairly generous here, but be careful, I don't think you want any more than this. And that's it to complete this. We will simply roll this up from the smaller end to the flat end where we started our cuts 
until we've created this beautiful knot, which we will then transfer into a buttered muffin tin with, of course, our seam facing down. And we'll give that a little pressing in so it stays in place. And that's it once we've done the braid and roll and they've all been placed in a buttered hole. We'll go ahead and cover these with a towel or a piece of plastic and we'll let those proof in a warm spot for about an hour or until they've just about doubled in size. Oh, note to self, hire intern to iron kitchen towels. But anyway, this is what mine looked like about an hour later. And that's it, we can go ahead and turn our oven on to 425. And while we're waiting for it to heat up, we can go ahead and brush these with a beaten egg, which is not only gonna help with the browning, but it's gonna help the next two things we sprinkle on the top stick. The first of which would be a little sprinkling of some nice flaky sea salt, all right, not too much, but I think a little bit goes really nicely with that dark chocolate and that rich, slightly sweet buttery dough. And then we'll finish these up with a very generous sprinkling of white sugar. Or if you're fancy, that larger demerara sugar. And that's it, after these have been egg washed and salted and sugared, they're ready to transfer into the center of a 425 degree oven for about 25 minutes or until they're beautifully browned and look like this. I mean, come on, how gorgeous is that? And right here you can get a great look at why we did all that work with the lamination. All right, there's no way to count them, but there has to be at least a thousand layers, allegedly. And then what we'll do is let these sit in the pan for about five or 10 minutes before we transfer them onto a rack to cool completely. And before I tear into one of these, I just want you to look at these and imagine you setting out a basket of these in front of someone you love or even just like and watching the expression on their face because what you'll see, and what you would see on my face now, if I ever showed my face when I eat, is a look of pure bliss. Okay, the combination of bread and chocolate is highly underrated, but when it's really good dark chocolate, and I'm talking really dark, like 88%, and you combine that with this very rich, eggy, buttery, slightly sweet bread, you end up with something so delicious, it's really hard to describe. And that's just the taste, right? The texture is equally outstanding, thanks to all that lamination and that buttery flaky goodness it produces. Oh, and because I always like to add a little very obvious advice in these videos, let me just mention, you could also add dried fruit and nuts to these, or pretty much any edible tidbit or doodad that you would add to a muffin. Okay, as long as you don't overstuff, those same things will work in this. So yes, as I already admitted, these do take a little bit of work, but sometimes, my friends, we just feel like showing off. And this really is a fantastic way to do that. But whether you're doing these to show off or show out or simply just show up with something amazing to eat, I really do hope you give these a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.